Hello, welcome to our next episode of Someone You Should Know. I am just continually blown away at who the Lord brings across Johnny's and my path that we are like, this is somebody that the body of Christ needs to be aware of. And specifically, um, usually we're looking for people that are in some way, obviously partnering with God in their area of culture, but who are actually pioneering like a new strategic way of doing something, um, what we would call the kingdom way. Um, we believe that God has the solutions for every problem that exists. And there are a lot of problems in media right now. And who I am so honored to introduce to you today, Brandon Showalter. He is a new breed of journalist. And, um, you know, when I had a conversation with Laura Logan through Steve Schultz a while back, um, she kind of speaks into this idea of journalists who are who are committed to doing this the right way. And Brandon is definitely one of those. I'm just going to read a quick bio of his. Brandon Showalter is a journalist and podcaster with the Christian Post who has reported extensively on topics of theological interest in the church, such as bioethics issues euthanasia, assisted suicide, artificial reproductive technology, surrogacy, and the developments of the gender identity movement and transgender ideology. He was first inspired to pursue a career in writing and journalism while mopping floors and scrubbing toilets as a church custodian in April of 2015. I mean, this is, this is a uh, the way the Lord started him. And I love it. If you heard my interview with Bobby Hobby, it was the same thing God did with him in a different area of culture, but um, it's that place of starting and servitude. It just, it, it shows the heart of Brandon for God to position him to do ultimately what he's doing now. He earned a bachelor's degree in international studies in Spanish from Bridgewater College of Virginia in 2007, a master of arts in human rights from the Catholic University of America in 2022. And he's a fellow of the John Jay Institute for Faith, Society and Law. He's also a graduate class of 2015 of the three year non degree program at Bethel School of Ministry in Redding, California. And so y'all just welcome to are someone you should know, Brandon Showalter. Hi, Elizabeth. It's good to be with you today. We're so glad to get to um, show you off and see how the Lord is using you. Um, I'm going to make sure I have my screen correct. Here we go. Um, wow. I, you and I have been chatting before we got started and actually for the last couple of months because you had a book that was going to be coming out soon and we were trying to time the release of um, the book with with taking advantage of this interview time. And um, we're definitely going to tell people about that book in a moment. But um, I wanted to just ask you a question just straight up before we even get into anything. And I do want you to share with people your history of how you ended up um, focusing right now on um, the gender issues in society, in your journalism, and your reporting. But before I ask that, because usually with the younger end of our generation, you have, you know, a very short window of time to grab their attention. So let's say that there are some young 20-something-year-olds that have come across this interview and, you know, they believe in God. They have a relationship with God. They may not be like really into church right now, um, but they they think of themselves as very um, compassionate um, lovers of God, you know, who mm -hmm. are trying to be relevant with what's going on in society. Why should they listen to this interview that we're about to do now and the things you're about to share with us? I think they should listen to this interview and what I'm about to share, because if they want to have true compassion, they need to learn how to distinguish that from the kind of compassion that is manipulatively weaponized against people. There is a difference between actual compassion, compassion, which means to suffer with, versus this convoluted notion of just giving everybody what they want and calling it love. There's a manipulation and a sinister weaponization of these very noble impulses. And when we when we speak, and I know we'll get into this in a, in a minute, but when we speak about these very touchy 
issues around gender identity and sexuality and all of that, there's this rush to not come down hard and not be judgmental. And I applaud that noble impulse because I think there have been, I know there have been churches, especially that have not handled or pastored these issues very well. But I think the pendulum swinging in the overcorrection direction is as destructive, if not more so, because when you fail to show true compassion and you draw any or or fail to um, uphold any kind of godly standard, it's actually not compassionate. Mm-hmm. It is not compassionate. And it is not loving to affirm <laughs> something that is fundamentally at odds with with nature. Um, if you want to show true compassion, it's got to be rightly ordered. And there's a way to do that where you can speak the truth in love, grace and truth. Grace, grace precedes truth, but we absolutely must do both. And we can do both. Well said. And, you know, I would add to that, that if you, this is not going to be an interview exclusively about, you know, sin or what someone's doing wrong. This is to help us understand what's actually happening behind the scenes Mm -hmm. and give some, some good solid information that will help you decide whether you agree with what Brandon just said or not, you know, I, this is probably a really poor analogy, but just my mind always wants to like really simplify something. Cause I mm-hmm. homeschooled my kids for many years. And so I was always trying to think of a simple way to, I just think if, if you knew, okay, a kid with an ice cream cone, but one street over, there's an ice cream factory that's trying to sell, you know, loads and loads and loads of ice cream. And they are just, pushing, giving it, making it impossible to refuse ice cream, ice cream, ice cream, ice cream. You would want to know that not only because you're not wanting to make your kids sick because they get too much ice cream, but there's also just one street over a plan to sell ice cream. And so we want to see what's the story behind the story and, and, and then understand, um, for those of you that are not young 20s, but you're you're maybe church leaders, we're also wanting to equip you through this interview and leave you with some resources that you can have that will help you and help us as the ecclesia, as the church, begin to speak wisely into issues that are affecting our children and the generations to come. So welcome, Brandon. Tell us a little bit about how you got into journalism and uh, specifically into what you're doing now. Well, I never could have imagined being a journalist, actually, which is it's crazy because when I did enter the profession, everybody said to me, oh, that's perfect for you. I totally see it. And I was like, well, heck if I knew. I mean, it was just not something that I was ever uh, thought I would do. Uh, and it was an adjustment getting started. But uh, you read in the introduction of my bio that I was first inspired to uh, break into a career in writing and journalism while mopping floors and scrubbing toilets as a church janitor. And that was actually at the tail end of my time at Bethel School of Ministry in Reading, where I was in the Lake Building there. I've I've scrubbed every toilet in that building and, you know, I've just (laughs) every square into that place. But I was, you know, singing and doing my work. And I was thinking about coming back to the D.C. area where I had lived before I went to school. And I was wondering what I would do next. And as I was mopping floors one day, I just had this idea of I need to write something. And what should I write about? And I just felt like the Holy Spirit dropped an idea, write about what it's like to be a church janitor. And so I did. I wrote an essay that I really liked. I still really like it. And I thought, I'm just going to send this to a friend who runs a blog um, channel on Pathios, which is the faith conversation website. And I said, I know you take guest submissions, right? Take a look at this. He ran it. It did really well. He loved it. And I thought, well, I'm going to just try this again. And so I wrote a few more blogs and they also did well. And because of that, he offered me my own blog on the channel. I could only do that for a year. And I I came, then I went back to DC and I did that and worked two other jobs, uh, which was just a crazy time. So I didn't get to do it as often as I wanted. But then when an opportunity came about in, I think, March of 2016 to apply for a job as a reporter with the Christian Post, I used 
I think that janitor essay and a few others as writing samples as part of my job application. Wow. Never done news reporting before, but I thought I meet all the qualifications here. I'm going to at least give this a try because I was desperate to make a change because I wasn't very happy with where I was professionally. Mm. Um, so I applied and I got started. And my first day of my trial period was actually the day after the Pulse nightclub shooting in Orlando, Florida, where all those uh, people were massacred, mm. 52 of them, I believe. Um, and so I was thrown in to covering these very hot button, touchy issues right from the jump. Uh, and because so, it was a, a gay club? Mm -hmm. Well, and it was particularly as the Christian Post, which is my employer now. Speaking that, about it. Yeah, speak the Christian response to it. And okay. one of the things that I remember happening as I, uh, I think it was pretty soon thereafter, one of my editors came into the newsroom and said, you know, we don't have to edit your pieces for tone because you're communicating what we believe graciously and truthfully. Mm -hmm. And so as a newbie journalist, I was thinking, well, even though it's kind of a touchy issue, if I'm excelling here, I'm getting this kind of feedback, maybe I'll just continue along these lines. Um, and then about a month or so later, the executive, uh, excuse me, the senior managing editor came in and said, we need somebody to write about all of these conversion therapy, you know, prohibitions and bills that are cropping up in various states and locales. And someone needs to do that. And I was remember thinking, should I do this? And I started to do this very Washington DC kind of hedging. Am I going to impede my career if I take on this topic and blah, 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 all this stuff started rolling around in my, my head. And I walked across the newsroom and I heard the Holy Spirit speak to me as clear as day. Brandon, are you ashamed of the gospel? And I, I remember thinking, no. And then I said, well, then you know what to do. And I told my editor I would write that article. And I sort of talked about what was going on in the States and got people to respond to it because not only was conversion therapy being, you know, wielded in a manipulative fashion to talk about those who were struggling with sexuality or whatever, but it was also with this gender identity uh, mm -hmm. phenomenon that we're seeing now where a young person who's confused about his or her body could then not receive counseling except the kind that would affirm them as the opposite sex. That was considered conversion therapy. So that was a rather new development um, at the time. Things had started to, to brew on that front a little bit, but my eyes started to become open to just how much the gender identity dogma had infected all of our institutions. And I saw how language was being warped and manipulated. And then I learned about how young children were being medicalized in pursuit of a physiological impossibility, being given puberty blockers, cross sex hormones, and then body altering surgeries, including on you know, girls as young as 13, having mastectomies, that kind of thing. And something inside me snapped. And yeah. the rest, as Paul Harvey might say, well, that's the rest yeah. of the story, I, I'm doing the rest of the story uh, contrary, in contradistinction to how the corporate press frames these issues. Um, that's how I've sort of seen my role at the Christian Post, and along with a couple of other journalists who work for, you know, alternative and more conservative leaning or Christian outlets. So we, there are a few of us who will not be gaslit by all the propaganda we see trying to tell children that their bodies are somehow wrong. So the rest is history, as they say. And I've just dug in ever since I knew, um, I, I, I'll just a brief anecdote. I've shared this before, but I'll share it here. When I was 14 years old, I remember reading my parents' Reader's Digest cover story about Wars Deary, the Somalian-born supermodel who has a campaign to end female genital mutilation. And as a teenager, I was so impacted by that story. It was such a bizarre and horrific evil. I couldn't believe that they would mm -hmm. cut the girl's genitals to do something so perverse. And yeah. I just remember being so horrified by that. Well, that's exactly what I felt at age 31 when I was a Washington DC journalist and I figured, well, okay, I've got a job in journalism. So maybe I can do something about this at the Christian Post. Wow. Amazing how God like planted that, right. that righteous anger in you from so young. Um, so you have a documentary that um, I've watched that I, that I highly recommend if, if someone is at all interested in having uh, an, educated opinion on the subject of what well, what do I even call this subject give me correct language for this I would say the subject is the relational and medical carnage of what gender ideology has wrought on society so 
in your documentary that that you produced, um, first of all, I didn't produce it. I was just in it. I'm just you in were it. just in it. Okay. I've okay. been I've been working with the filmmaker, helping the word get out because it's an indie documentary with you know, it's just a a filmmaker who loves the truth and wanted to tell a compelling story. It's not like she has some big giant budget, but yeah, I've been. So tell us the name of it, where people can view it, and what what how did you end up being involved in that? The documentary film is called Dead Name. Two words. Uh, for those who don't know, if you dead name, use that as a verb, someone who identifies as trans or the opposite sex or non-binary or some other gender identity, that's referring to them as their given birth name that their parents chose for them. And picking a name is the first step in the identification process of becoming this other person. Um, but it's an emblematic, it's the struggle sort of emblematic of what families and parents go through because it, she picked the, that title, dead name, as the title because of how it's not just about the person's self-identification process as it is. It introduces a whole rash of problems and it disrupts family life um, and it just sort of encapsulates it all. But the filmmaker who is not a religious person um, wanted to give a voice to suffering parents who did not have a voice in the mass media and indeed the corporate press only showcases parents who celebrate their trans identified children as these stunning brave people who then go on to this pathway of experimental medicalization she wanted to as i mentioned paul harvey she wanted to tell the rest of the story what it's really like for families and she'd seen a speech that i'd given in louisiana the summer of 2020 and reached out in early 2021 to see if i would be interested in being a contributor to her documentary to sort of give some expert commentary. Interestingly enough, I had been praying and fasting during January of 2021, and I wrote in my prayer journal that my work was going to be featured in documentary films this year. I just felt the Holy Spirit tell that to me. Wow. But two months later, she happens to reach out. And I'm like, oh, okay. Uh, later, that, later that year, I would wind up in one of Tucker Carlson's documentaries. So the Lord had much bigger plans than even I could fathom at the time. But she, this, this documentary is so, so powerful because it profiles three families, all of whom have uniquely horrific stories of what has happened to their children, but there's, there are threads that connect them all, particularly the institutional capture and how the institutions undermine and marginalize parents who urge caution. Parents concerned about well, what are puberty blockers and hormones going to do to my child's body? Is it this this suicide thing really true? I mean, what what's what's going to the even the most cautious, hesitant parents are castigated as bigoted and hateful. I mean, it's just astonishing to see the ferocity and the brutal force with which so many places in society where you would hope you could get some sound help for your distressed child have now been taken over by a dogma that has the gall to tell you as a parent who loves your child more than anything that somehow you're hateful if you don't agree that they can become the opposite sex and so it's an intimate portrait glimpse fly on the wall kind of yeah. picture of what these families actually go through and it's a major gut punch and i speak in the film about how it's been i've lost count elizabeth how many moms and dads have reached out to me just wailing and crying and sobbing and desperate to save their children from irreversible medical harm hormones and surgery and all of that they don't know what to do and so this film gives them a voice and people can still go see it at deadnamedocumentary.com i very much recommend it small fee to watch but uh, indie filmmakers gotta eat too that's right Okay, we'll put that link in the description um, along with Tucker Carlson's um, way you can access that one as well. And I'll have you share about that one in a second. I just, you know, I, I um, have a newborn grandson and mm -hmm. just, you know, it's just fresh again, just how vulnerable our children are and how God gives them to us to mm -hmm. take care of and the incredible responsibility that you feel over each one of them, if you're even a semi-decent parent, right? when, when they're struggling with something um, and you, you go to who you deem are experts around you, whether it's in medicine or in therapy, counseling, whatever, you're going there. And I'm, I'm trying to even teach my adult children this. When you go somewhere, you're asked, you're the one making the decision. You're just collecting information to help you make a responsible decision for yourself or your child or your family. That's 
what it means to be human is to have that freedom to make right. informed decisions. But if you go and they're literally only giving you pretty much one option mm-hmm. and it's pretty immediate and, and there, there aren't, um, you know, it's, let's go ahead and bring the vaccine situation to this. When, when you're told here, take this vaccine, there's not been adequate studies done on it. You mm-hmm. don't have good statistics from long term to look at. Mm-hmm. You you aren't given multiple options. Well, right. you could do this or this or this, and it's up to you. Mm-hmm. It's the same thing in this area. Like for parents, you, you mm-hmm. realize that when you watch Dead Name documentary. Um, if there's anything else you want to say about that or about the the Tucker Carlson documentary, I'd love to hear about that as well. Well, you're absolutely right, um, and. For those of us who have spent the last several years screaming into the void, that's what it's felt like. Finally, now with this rash of states passing various laws um, restricting this for minors, um, we're we're starting to feel a little bit vindicated. And finally, we have forced this into be a, becoming a national discussion. Um, I write about that the institutional capture. That this talking about one option. Yeah, it's you sound tinfoil hat conspiracy when you talk about ideological capture of organizations. But I've done enough research and investigation to know that ideologues absolutely have taken over mainstream professional organizations such as the American Academy of Pediatrics and the Endocrine Society, mm-hmm. these vaunted, respected organizations that, you know, have been taken over by ideologues. And I've traced how their guidelines were revamped after you know, certain institutions opened up and certain doctors in academic medicine started making these moves. And it takes a lot of discernment because when you have something, you know, you have institutions that were previously trustworthy parroting these dogmatic lines, you think, well, who am I to just not trust these institutions? I can't go up against the AAP. No, you absolutely can because you're a thinking person. We write about, this is the book that I recently co-authored. It's a paperback copy, but it's actually a an ebook, but we have an entire chapter in there devoted to how this ideology conquered our institutions, especially in the medical arena. Uh, the first pediatric gender clinic in the United States opened in 2007, and it was hardly, I mean, I didn't even hear about it. I didn't know what that was all about, um, but it has grown steadily, and there was a concerted effort to allow this to explode. And now there, I've lost count how many there are. There, every children's hospital is clamoring to have one if they don't already. And so you just see this spreading like a, a virus uh, across the land where children are being psychologically dissociated from their sex bodies and then told that the pathway to becoming their authentic selves is this experimental medicalization. Um, it's just really exploded in the last several years, but that has um, come as a constellation of societal forces have worked to undermine public trust that they can actually know what they know about the human body. That yes, there is this thing called a gender identity that all children have uh, knowable only to themselves and that we just have to let them be who they need to be. And there's then this pathway of medical treatment that will then help them become who they are or whatever. And a variety of forces have contributed to this breakdown of understanding ourselves as embodied persons that has then contributed to the morass and the most horrific medical scandal that I think we are now starting to see. I do believe that as this year goes by and even into the next several years, we're going to see medical carnage, disfigured bodies, sterile people, young people who were irretrievably harmed come forward uh, and talk about how this was all a bill of goods. Um, And it will be so great the extent of it that it won't be able to be ignored. Um, But when people ask me, why do I care so much about this small group of people who call themselves trans? I'm like, a medical scandal is eminently newsworthy. Journalists should care about that. Whatever you think of LGBTQ plus one, two, three, X, Y, Z issues, it's like, if you're going to be giving children drugs that will render them sterile, if you're going to be cutting off their physically healthy organs, As a journalist, that's a story, and I am not inculcated with a dogma that's going to tell me that that's actually healthcare. And as believers, um, and that's why I brought you on here, is to Mm -hmm. speak to our audience of followers of Jesus, the kingdom is meant to showcase God's solutions in every area of not Mm -hmm. just our hearts, but our lives and of society, and to stand up for Mm -hmm. the least of these. 
That's right. Um, and the worst, and the worst, because the victims are children. I think it's yeah. just all the worst. I mean, there's young people um, doing that, and I think you. I forgot to answer your bit about the Tucker Carlson documentary. Yeah. There's a cool backstory to that too, but I think if anybody wants to see the Holy Spirit working powerfully through someone, he absolutely is through Tucker Carlson in that documentary in particular. It gives glory to Jesus, believe it or not, at the end. It's a Fox Nation, Fox Nation documentary called Transgressive, the Cult of Confusion, and he shows how this ideology functions very much as a cult. And there's also another cool backstory we can talk about that, but that's that's it's one of those signs of hope that you see in the culture that that documentary really sort of un, unpacks it all in a very 47 minutes of very eye-opening, um, very eye-opening fashion about how this all works. Wow, I, I, I definitely want Johnny and I to see that. Can you only view it if you're a, like subscribed to Fox Nation? Is that the... I think there's probably a bootleg copy out there. I don't know, somewhere, but I, I will. I think Fox Nation, it's worth, very much worth it. I think you can yeah. a free trial or something and just see that one. I mean, I'm, idea. Yeah, probably something like that. But it, I'll include some information about I'm, that. Not that I'm advocating watching bootleg stuff. That's no, not, of course not. <laughs> but it is, I bet you there's something out there. A, a question I see here in some of the information that you gave me is that. Um, the number of minors in America receiving a diagnosis of gender dysphoria tripled from 2017 to 2021. And then kind of on the other end of that, the re response to that is recent polling from McLaughlin and Associates and Summit Ministry shows over 70 percent of Americans, just straight up Americans, are angry about the deliberate attempts to expose our kids and grandkids to the transgender movement. Um, you know, do we have any stats, first of all, on what is normal for children? You know, if you were to ask adults now, how many of you like thought when you were younger about maybe wearing clothes of the opposite sex or were drawn to kind of be a little more masculine, a little more feminine or you know, or we even questioned and wondered if you were supposed to be a girl or a boy. Do we have any stats on what kinds of questions are normal? Uh, I don't know of statistics on those particular questions um, uh, because I think what I hear anecdotally, however, is from older women, especially thank God this wasn't around when I was a kid. I was such a big tomboy mm -hmm. and today they would have put me on the blockers and or cross sex hormones. I hear yeah. that all the time. Radical feminists and lesbians are in my inbox regularly saying the same thing. I mean, I talk to a wide variety of people, mm -hmm. Republican, Democrat, Christian, non-religious, Jewish, atheist, agnostic, the whole span of the whole spectrum is talking to, to the Christian post these days because they're just desperate to save their children from irreversible medical harm. And that is what we are talking about. It is, it is trauma to the body. What, what these drugs and this experimental medicalization does, it's not in keeping with sound science because if you overload your female body with synthetic male hormone, of course it's gonna be bad for you. Your vocal cords are gonna thicken, your voice register is gonna drop and you won't get that back. If you stay on testosterone as a female for very long, your uterus will atrophy and doctors will have to perform a prophylactic hysterectomy. And then your endocrine system is hijacked, which is it's a, when you hijack your endocrine system, it's a very delicate ecosystem mm -hmm. and you can cause yourself a whole host of problems, cardiac issues, kidney problems, liver complications, you name it. There's, when you mess with your hormones, it's a disaster. Mm -hmm. I interviewed a, a detransitioner not so long ago who um, she took the hormones at a, she went to a neighboring state to get uh, this. I think she might've been, she lived in either Maryland or Virginia and went to a DC gender clinic. I think it was just because it was closer. It was just happened to be the closest one. She lived near the border. And so it was the DC gender clinic, but she went there and got her treatments. And um, they told her that, you know, they had never seen a young woman who I think was 19 or 20 at the time have so many problems, kidney stones. Mm. But the, the testosterone injections that she had, they had never seen a young woman uh, have have so many problems with her kidneys because that's just not something that 19 or 20 year old women get kidney stones very often, but all the hormones impacted that. Wow. And she's since detransitioned, but is um, 
is now like the endocrinologists that are working with her are good doctors and they're trying to help her. But even they have admitted, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll measure your blood levels and track your hormone. You know, we'll, we'll do what we can to help you. But because this has been an experiment that's been unleashed on so many people, every person is different and there's no, you know, good data to work with really about who these detransitioners are as a cohort of people. So it's all one big mass medical experiment that has been unleashed on vulnerable people. And so good statistics are hard to come by even in the medical arena where we need them. And I think that is as much of a medical scandal mm -hmm. as the medical scandal of transing, uh, you know, young people, especially. And in fact, in the UK in the Tavistock uh, clinic, which thank God has closed, was ordered to close after they did an independent review of that gender clinic, largest one in England, in London. One of the things that came out in the reports of was that they had shoddy record keeping. These are not, you know, scrupulous people um, who are, I mean, yes, you'd think that a lot of things would be documented, but I know that detransitioners, when they go back to the doctors that harmed them, they get dropped like hot potatoes. They are not treated well because they don't serve the narrative that this is the standard of care, that this is the great pathway of treating your gender confusion or whatever. Um, but yes, I mean, gender non-conforming young people, if you're a boy that likes to dance and prefers the music and the arts, or if you're a girl who's more tomboyish and you don't fit with more, you know, culturally rigid stereotypes, well, many of them on the autism spectrum, in fact, uh, they are sitting ducks for this ideology that's just being drilled into their heads through social media, YouTube, Tumblr, school media. There's nowhere to escape. This movement is wherever there's Wi-Fi. And so that's in deep red states and deep blue states too. The difference is that in sort of deeper blue, more liberal areas, it's, it's more celebrated. But you'd be surprised. This is affecting people where you wouldn't think it could get, but it is. So on the medical side of this, how you have these, um, I think you said the AAP, is that what it's called? Mm -hmm basically yeah. has their talking points and they're feeding them to doctors and hospitals mm -hmm. that are the ones actually interacting with kids and their parents. And yeah. so what's a typical scenario um, that you've seen, like where a child will maybe one day a little boy starts saying, well, I want to dress like the princess in Disney, you know, what, what happens from there? How, how easy does a does a child fall into this 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 pit? It's astonishing. Parents are strong armed, and they are told this is typical. Would you rather have a dead son or a living daughter? They are told that their children either are very likely to or will commit suicide unless they go along with this prescribed pathway of treatment. It's diabolical, Elizabeth. There's no other way to put it. Mm -hmm. And the institutional capture, there's, I've, I've done some reporting on how groups like the AAP, the Endocrine Society, activists have been steadily and very stealthily taking over and overhauling professional guidelines that sort of lead in this direction. I think the Endocrine Society's guidelines were revamped in 2009 and then again in 2017, all in the direction of gender affirmation, as they call it. All, the language twisting around this is just massive. And it's just, you, you go crazy trying to sift it. Just what are they actually talking about when they talk about gender affirmation? They're not talking about affirming you as your biological sex. They're talking about affirming you as the gender you think you are, even though it's completely untethered from material reality. And mm -hmm. so there's, there's a script. Uh, Jamie Reed is a whistleblower at this at Washington University, St. Louis gender clinic who wrote a riveting sort of whistleblower report in the free press some weeks ago, Barry Weiss's new outlet, where she has, she wrote about how it was just, it was just such manipulation that parents, and I think said, and she said in subsequent interviews, parents felt like they had no choice, but to just completely go along with it. Um, and so that's in the pediatric clinical settings, what parents are often told. And it's often right away, pediatricians are just trained to just affirm the child as whatever gender they think they are right away. When you get to be a teenager, it's even scarier because in some places, some states, I think Oregon, the age of majority is 15, very liberal states where they've lowered the age where young people can make medical decisions for themselves. They can and go- And their parents would never know. And their parents are not allowed to know. Their, the schools keep it from the parents. There's internal policies in school systems and in certain other settings where parents are kept completely in the dark or they even have 
it within the schools and that kind of thing. And it's just beyond. It's it's literally not, not, it's acknowledged that at that age, they're, they're not able to drive a car responsibly. They're not allowed to drink alcohol. I mean, it's, it's, it's so, it sounds so crazy. It sounds so crazy, but I swear I'm not making it up. I mean, cause I get these phone calls from parents yeah. who are panicked out of their mind. Um, but parents, because especially if they're told that their child's going to commit suicide, they panic and they freeze because nobody wants a dead kid. Right. But, but then, but as a, as a young, as young people are, are told that they can choose this for themselves in certain ages, you can get a young woman who's you know, 18 years old, and this is probably in most states, within a 30-minute telehealth call for Planned Parenthood, she can obtain testosterone the same day. And you don't even you don't even need a diagnosis for gender dysphoria to get it. It's a controlled substance, but did you I mean it's just they're passing it out like it's candy. That's not being hyperbolic. It's insane how quickly they can get their hands on these drugs. It's not regulated and it's it's just so bizarre. I, I, and, and horrifying. I know of a case where I believe um, a family was in Arizona, a very young troubled girl ran away to the state of Oregon and she was able to emancipate herself, I think through some law. And as a minor, as a 17 year old child was able to undergo um, a legal name change in the Oregon state courts. She was able to have both of her breasts cut off and her entire reproductive system cut out paid for by Medicaid. I think those happened as a minor, definitely the breast cutoff and the, and the, the hysterectomy and the oophorectomy, all of those, you know, surgeries. And then at, I think age 19 or 20, she had the radial forearm phalloplasty where they harvest tissue from her forearm to make a fake penis. I've seen photos of this girl and it about sent me into apoplexy, but I know that mom personally. And so people want to say all this stuff isn't happening to minors. Uh, you read my inbox. Like I, I've got, I see the carnage on the front lines. It's absolutely happening. There are girls as young as 13 in this country that have had their breasts amputated. And I've seen footage of a gender, a gender clinician from Oakland claiming that they have done a breast amputation to a 12 year old girl, but children are as young as, you know, eight years old are you know, getting blockers and hormones. Um, so this is a scandal of epic proportions. And um, it's some of the most horrific uh, medical and child abuse the world has ever seen. But worst of all, it's marketed to our youth in the context of an identity. And so mm -hmm. this scandal and this harm is being broadcast as health. Everything is inverted. Concurrent with the medical scandal is the ideological indoctrination to make society, uh, to remake society in keeping with these very dark ideological aims. So what it based on all the research that you've done and your perspective as a Christian, what do you feel like is behind the agenda? Like, is it depopulation? Is it what? I get that question a lot that people, people bring up the depopulation. Whenever you're messing with fertility and you're sterilizing people, you have to just wonder mm -hmm. I, as a journalist, I would not want to make that claim unless I could see documents and sort of connecting the dots between, you know, depopulation advocates who are actually deliberately doing this. And so I'm not going to go on record and say that, mm -hmm. but it just kind of, some people, you can kind of put two and two together. What, what, whether that is the case or not, the effect is children are being sterilized. And so mm -hmm. if you have more sterile people, your population isn't going to increase if, it, if you get more and more people sterile. So effectively that's, that is what's happening. But um, I see this in terms of as a Christian, Obviously, the cosmic battle between good and evil, mm -hmm. um, you know, the enemy of our souls, Satan, the devil, the evil one, uh, whatever you want to call him. <laughs> I, I heard a Catholic teacher once say to me, and it has stuck with me, that he always wages war on the image of God, his male and female, mm -hmm. and seeks to twist and distort sexuality, and the sex of our body, if, because if he can destroy that, he can then rob God of his generosity as the creator and giver of life. And so the devil doesn't have a body, but we, our bodies showcase who we are. The body, the gospel is about the redemption of the body. I mean, the sexual union between male and female, when, in, when done and intended in the channels that God designed it, it glorifies God in a very beautiful way. And so the enemy wages war on that with some ferocious fury. And so I'm mindful of Ephesians 6, that we wrestle not against 
you know, flesh and blood, but against powers, principalities, and spiritual wickedness in high places. And this is some of the most bitter, ferocious kind of spiritual warfare because um, it's a war on the human body. Um, you know, God tells us, you know, the psalmist declared in Psalm 139 that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Um, God makes no mistakes. I think transgender ideology, in addition to just being such it's not scientific at all. You don't have to be a Christian to know that human beings are sexually dimorphic mammals. We're male and female. We're embodied person. That's an easily observable, manifestly true scientific fact. But it is such a threat to the gospel because you can't get Genesis 127 wrong without getting the whole gospel wrong. We're made male and female in God's image. I'm going to plant my flag on that hill and I will not back down <laughs> one inch from that because that images forth who we are as persons. Um, it's a beautiful thing. It's a glorious thing. God doesn't make mistakes. And so that's how I come at it spiritually. Um, but again, I I hear from all kinds of people who don't share my theological paradigm about all of this. And they're starting to see it too, because they know that you know it wasn't an accident that their children were born male or female. This is a war on reality. This is a war on um, in fact, I'll just share this quote. There's an atheist evolutionary biologist who I refer to all the time that I think in March 2020 summed it up as best as I've ever heard it. He insists upon the sexual binary and he fights for the reality of biological sex as male and female because, and I'm paraphrasing, if we don't hold on to that and we lose that ground in culture, we will become uh, hostages to chaos. And that is our last tether to reality. Gender ideology, transgenderism, whatever you want to call it, in addition to being a horrific medical scandal and a child abuse scourge, it represents the death of reality. Mm -hmm. That's a big deal. That's a big deal. It's a big deal. We will lose reality as we know it if we can somehow convince ourselves that men can be women. There's a lesbian feminist who I know who says, I know of, I don't know her personally, but she says, the word trans has one function, to falsify reality. As soon as you have a word that can institute a lie that a man can become a woman or is a woman, everything is reversed. She's not wrong. Wow. Wow. I dropped a lot on you there, but it was just like, a, it's, so, I mean, it's, it's good because I think some of the pushback that we get as Christians is you're just trying to make this a religious issue. And, okay. and I love that as a, um, an integrous journalist, you are sticking, I mean, you, you're allowed mm -hmm. an opinion as a follower of Jesus yeah. as well, but you are sticking as a journalist to the research that mm -hmm. speaks for itself and the, the experiences that people are having, the families, the lives mm -hmm. that are being destroyed. Can you speak? We have, and we just very quickly on that note, yeah. we have over 100 citations of our, of our book, Exposing the Gender Lie, the majority of which are from secular sources. And that's what I was going to ask if yeah. you would give us some highlights from the book, and we'll include in the notes here um, a link to the ebook where you can get it. First of all, who would benefit from reading it? And then give us some teasers from it. Well, I co authored this ebook with Dr. Jeff Myers of Summit Ministries. We met last summer and we wanted to write about the issue of the ideology and the medical scandal that it is, how it twists and distorts language, and how it is actually an industry. The subtitle of the book is How to Protect Children and Teens from the Transgender Industry's False Ideology. And we were very deliberate about how we chose that title because there's a whole cottage industry in the medical arena and the counseling arena in all of culture that seeks to profit handsomely off of this medical exploitation of children. Um, and it's marketing this to them via social media, through the schools, through the media. Um, and people need to know. We wanted to write it primarily for pastors, lay leaders, youth ministers, but really anybody who's interested um, about not only what this ideology is and how it functions, but how you can be equipped with the philosophical tools to understand just what this thing called transgender ideology is. But then in the chapter, it's five chapters, it's a very succinct read. The fifth chapter is more of a redemptive 
gospel response to what does it mean to be male and female? We're not saying that you have to return to gender norms, rigid norms of yesteryear. If you're a boy that likes music and the arts, we celebrate that. Be who God made you to be. There's nothing wrong with your body. If you're a girl who prefers math and likes engineering, we bless that too. There's no such thing as, I mean, pink and blue. When did, why did we assign gender gender to those colors. You don't do that with green or orange or red and yellow. Let's just unpack some of the ridiculousness around this, but then also talk about how God made us man, man and woman, male and female, that has profound spiritual meaning. Let's celebrate that difference. Let's showcase the beauty of the gospel. That's That was our aim. Um, but we, <clears throat> I mean, anybody who's interested, I mean, I, I got plenty of people who are not Christians who are reading this book, you know, because it, if it's truthful, it'll speak for itself. Yeah. But we we wanted to just equip people to understand the severity of the threat mm-hmm. and why this is completely diametrically opposed to the gospel of Jesus Christ and why Christians and everybody who's got a thinking brain can't lend one iota of credence to it. This stuff is completely at odds with reality. We need to reject it all with enthusiasm while also caring for people who are struggling. I want to add that. And we, we certainly, we don't hold ourselves out as mental health professionals or therapists. Certainly we don't give mental health advice. A lot of people who find themselves down this pathway have some sort of adverse childhood experience or a cluster of other mental health, you know, psychiatric comorbidities. They deserve our compassionate care. We certainly want to emphasize that as well. Absolutely. And there, there must be other options and other solutions. Mm-hmm. And it, it, in a worst case scenario, just something that puts up a boundary that says, wait till at least this age to make any uh, lasting changes or, or medical choices related to mm-hmm. what the child may or may not be struggling with. Um, yeah. But even I, here's the, I would, yeah, I don't disagree with that because yeah. there should, we would certainly think there should be safeguards, but I think Christians need to be even bolder than that. I, 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 applaud, I applaud all the efforts at the state level to try and protect minors. Yeah. I'll tell you, this isn't healthcare for any person at any age, Elizabeth. I yeah. don't I mean, God doesn't make a single mistake. And, you know, if this, this used to be the kind of thing where doctors who practiced this kind of thing were very sparse and almost underground. And you had to go through years of counseling and hurdles to come over. But at the end of the day, I mean, we need a sort of a re- revival in biomedical ethics that you don't remove Absolutely. physically healthy body parts in pursuit of a physiological impossibility. And you don't administer drugs on an experimental basis, again, because of a psychological ailment where you will deliberately take your hormones out of balance. I'm not a psychiatrist, but I don't know a single psychiatric condition where you would purposely take your sex hormones and, you know, <laughs> hijack them at levels where you don't cause a whole host of damage to the rest of your body. I mean, let's let's revive biomedical ethics. Very good, very good. Couldn't agree more. Um, and I I learned so much reading exposing the gender lie, and I highly recommend it to really everyone that's listening. And um, I think it would be amazing if people could not only promote this interview but promote that book on their social media. We have to we have to show up where the agenda is showing mm-hmm. up yeah. and equip parents and grandparents and leaders, as you said, to understand um, what is coming against our kids. Yeah. And it's, 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 um, it's hit close to home. I wanted to bring this up here in Nashville. Um, today is the, let's see, what's the date, the 28th of March. And yesterday, um, we had a, a very tragic event happen here at a um, at a private Christian elementary school in Nashville. And Brandon, I know you're aware of it. Would you just kind of speak to that and and help us understand um, through the media's response to this mm-hmm. what just kind of reinforces some of the things that you're talking about today? Right. Well, right. And so, like you said, this is, you know, March 28th. We, who, whenever this is uploaded, things may change. And so just take that, you know, whenever you watch this, just take this with whatever may unfold in the, as the investigation and everything proceeds. But uh, it appears that a troubled young woman who identified as trans took a high powered gun to this school where she was once a student. 
and killed six people, three children, three adults. Um, it was horrific, of course. And one of the children that was murdered was the young daughter, a nine-year-old, nine-year-old daughter of the pastor that's linked with this school. Everybody's heartbroken. And uh, I, I'm, I'm hearing that there was some sort of a manifesto. We'll see if we we see it. But um, no, really tragic case. This This school, the church had recently put out uh, a report, the school or church, one or both of them had put out a report that they did not wish to be a church that was surrendering to the sexual revolution, which unfortunately the mainline churches pretty much all have. And as we've seen, even some evangelical churches are sort of tilting in that direction. Whereas, you know, the Christian Post, my publication is absolutely not, has has zero patience for that. We, we see um, these issues as central to the gospel and not something we can, this is not a denominational sort of agree to disagree, you yeah. know, secondary or tertiary doctrinal matter. This is primary stuff. Genesis 127, being made male and female in God's image, that that's a make or break kind of thing for, for us and for me. Um, but it, the media's response to it, I have found at least some outlets. I was keeping track of some tweets from places like Newsweek and even ABC News and Big USA Today all either talking about, oh, how the, the shooter was misgender, misidentified or whatever. And then Tennessee recently took some steps to restrict drag shows for children and this chemical and surgical transing of children. And that was brought up. That was associated with this shooting. At Nashville's in Tennessee. And so the, the mass media, the mainstream corporate press is linking these two things, at least in the initial reports that I have seen. Who knows what will happen in the intervening days? But I mean, I'm just, I mean, <laughs> when you when you work in the news media and you see how disgusting the behavior, the behavior of the corporate press has been around this, they are willing to twist language and undercut the basic building blocks of our knowledge by women and women men, and then employing a plethora of gender politically correct euphemisms in their reporting and confused the masses and we've got the public in a psychological straitjacket of deceit about something as basic as our bodies. You learn to not be shocked, but even seeing how they were framing the coverage of this massacre, even as children are riddled with bullets, you're, they're bringing up the politics of Tennessee, trying to take steps to protect children from irreversible medical harm. It just makes my head explode. Um, and it's, it's just hard not to get angry, but you know, <laughs> Yesterday, I was supposed to be my day off. I did an event in Dallas this week, and so I was just pretty tired. But everybody was messaging me about the shooting, and they couldn't figure out whether the shooter was male or female because of all of the trans lingo that was being employed. And as if to prove our point, because in this the book, we've got an entire chapter about how it's a feature, not a bug, of transgender ideology to twist language in service to its ideological aims. The confusion is the point. And so we're all left wondering, well, what happened? And can we even know the basics of reality anymore? And, you know, it's this postmodern insanity where, you know, it's an undoing of the idea that the words that we use actually correspond to anything that's actually real. And so we see the chaos already. We don't even know what happened. Is the shooter male or female? We don't know because they've sown all of these contrived words you know, rooted in, you know, queer theory and pseudoscience in the academic world that's been gestating in their institutions, that's now governing public discourse. Yeah. The Associated Press has guidelines that we're supposed to use wrong sex pronouns for people who say that they are the opposite sex. The Christian Post won't participate in that because we, it's just so manipulative. And in fact, because we called Assistant Secretary of uh, Health and Human Services, Rachel Levine, we were frozen from Twitter for nine months before Elon Musk let us back on at the end of last year. <laughs> I mean, it's just like that's the level to which they will try to warp our minds into believing things that are just false. The yeah. gaslighting is constant. Um, and so I, the confusion and the chaos, uh, that's that's inherent to what this ideology is all about. But worst of all, there's this propaganda that is, is driving young people insane. And I think the shooter, um, I don't know for sure if she was on testosterone, a synthetic hormone, it wouldn't surprise me at all if she was. But when, you know, testosterone, it's what makes males kind of aggressive. And that's, you know, channeled rightly, you know, in, in males, that can be a good thing, but a female body is not meant to take 
you know, why huge levels of testosterone. And I don't, I, I want to stop and be very careful that I don't say that that is absolutely what caused the shooting. I, I'm not going to make a link like that, but I think we have to note that, you know, when you, when you lie to children and when you tell them that it's fine and you don't ever tell them the truth, it's the fruit's going to be terrible. Um, I'm not blaming all transgender identified people on this act of violence. I wouldn't dream of doing that. Right. And I want to urge everyone to just reach out and minister to the victims and not respond. Don't return evil for evil. We, we need to be gracious and Christ-like and, you know, it's, it's hard, but um, I, I find it very interesting that the church school that was attacked was a church that had publicly released reports saying that they would not bow their knee to the sexual revolution, which I believe, Elizabeth, that the sexual revolution is a totalitarian war against nature. It's a war against God. It's a war against humanity. It's an existential threat to the church. I know Jesus has promised that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church, but that doesn't mean that he won't try to wipe out the influence of the gospel in a certain margin of the earth. That's a global promise. I'm sure the devil would like to do nothing more than to completely murder the influence of the gospel in a land, and he'll do it with the secularizing power of uh, distorting sex and gender. He absolutely will. We need to understand the threat that it is so that we can respond accordingly. Yes, and you know, I think that that is compassion. You know, we started talking about compassion. That is compassion, is to care um, about mm -hmm. the people that this is affecting. It's affecting, um, you know, society as a whole, but also the people that are struggling with it as children mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. as, you know, older ones. And we have to stay in the conversation. I think as, as Christians, we are responsible um, to be known by our love. Yeah. And love doesn't always tell you what you want to hear. Yeah. But yeah. but love makes sure that it that it goes the extra mile. Yeah. To let the the recipient know yeah. they really genuine genuinely are cared about and loved. Yeah. So we have to learn as the church to talk about these kind of issues while still loving the people yeah. that we're, you know arguing over <laughs> and, and, and it's both. And mm -hmm. absolutely. And you certainly will never hear me calling people who are confused, vile slurs or names. I can't even imagine doing that. We, we need to be, you know, careful and, and certainly cautious that we, we, we join people in their process. A question I often get is, well, should you ever use a pronoun or should you ever sort of walk on eggshells around these people? And I said, you need to take this before the Lord. You need to truly sort of ask the Holy Spirit what the person in front of you needs yeah. and join them in their process. Don't affirm the lie. Yeah. Don't don't lie to them and do everything you can, I think, to mitigate medical harm. That, that's when, when parents call me, I say, pull out all the stops to make sure that your, your child is not irreversibly medically harmed. So do whatever you have to do then, because that's that's really where I think most the, the worst damage of this is. Yeah. Um, but you have to be guided by the Holy Spirit um, with each individual person because, you know, they're, you know, not every case is the same. You know, you, you've, there are patterns, there are trends, there, you know, there are typical things that happen in the lives of young people who become mired in this, but the Lord knows what each person needs. And so it's your job to seek his face and to find out what that is and then respond accordingly. That's right. And I, I think that's what your book um, with Dr. Jeff Myers does such a great job at is is helping uh, the reader understand. Make simple the complexities and the confusion that has intentionally been sewn into this issue yeah. so that you can go before the Lord and say, OK, I understand this now for this person that I'm actually dealing with. Mm -hmm. Where do I meet them? And right. how, how do I, how do I show up in a way that leaves a bridge mm -hmm. and creates, um, creates room for conversation while I'm still fighting mm -hmm. on a societal mm -hmm. level yeah. against the agenda that is coming against our, our children and our generation. It's, it's both and. 
It absolutely is both and. And I'll also say, I actually said this in the Tucker Carlson documentary, um, that I can't even begin to describe how it has crushed me mm. to engage this space. Um, it's just, it when you, when you hear from a, a parent, a mom or a dad who will move heaven and earth to try and save their son or their daughter from being irreversibly disfigured or sterilized, it's just... I, I just, I can even right now feel my heart start to ache and just twinge. It's like, but here's the thing. If you're a Christian and you're watching this, you have to realize that there are people in your neighborhood that are suffering in silent agony and they haven't told a soul. You need to be that safe place and you need to be willing to be crushed mm -hmm. and suffer with them because it's only in the, in the crushing where the anointing comes, yeah. where you can set captives free. There's only, it's only in sort of sharing in their suffering where you can really start to see the synergy of the Holy Spirit take off because it's absolutely brutal. What I mean, parents who reach out to me, parents who I've prayed and fasted with that their children be set free from this confusion. It's, it's like nothing else there. It's a unique, it's an exquisite form of torture as one mom has put it to me. There's wow. nothing else quite like it. Mm. And they wouldn't wish, wish this family suffering and disruption on their worst enemy. It's absolutely mm. terrible. But as a person who believes in the hope of the gospel, I just have to believe yeah. that one little rock in this Goli and this Goliath will fall as well. Yeah. Somehow, and I don't know when, and the timing I think is the hardest part of following Jesus, that God is not going to be content to allow this scourge, this beast to continue to devour our children. And he's got some great and glorious plan down the road to rehabilitate and do something great with restoration. And I'm going to be there celebrating when it happens. But Christians, you're going to have to be there for the long haul for a lot of these families. Yeah, get been through something unimaginably horrible. And um, don't just run straight toward the suffering. Don't don't shy away from it. Just, 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 just go full on into it and ask God to give you grace and he will. So good. So good. And, and I just uh, appreciate how not only are you having impact and I believe it's really going to increase in the days to come, especially with the release of this new book. Um, you're not only having impact, but, but you are really a picture of what we would call a reformer in the seven mountains of culture. You are partnering with the Lord in the gifts and talents that he's given you to show up in the trenches of real everyday life as a journalist. So you're not only, you know, coming up against the issues in, in media, but then the issues of whatever the topic is that you're researching and putting forward. Um, it's both. And and there's a lot of uh, what we would call warfare that comes with that. Um, and I love that God has kept your heart tender in that. And, you know, I think that's one of the, the ways that um, you are pioneering in media is, you know, you think of so many reporters as kind of being stoic and, and understandably so we're, we're, we know that a reporter needs to be um, unbiased, mm -hmm. but yet God is the original communicator. He's the original one that, that gives us facts in the context of truth. And he's never disconnected his heart from what he's communicating. And it's hard yeah. to do, but it can be done. And, and you, you've allowed your heart to stay, um, stay connected to the issues that, that you're, you're reporting on. And I'm, I'm just grateful that you are modeling that in the body of Christ. Well, thank you. And it, it is, it is indeed a challenge. I don't do it perfectly, certainly, but um, I think, you know, journalists are on the front lines and, you know, we're, we're not always believed when we report what we see um, because it is, especially something like this, it's so unpleasant. There's kind of an analysis paralysis that comes on people. They think, Oh, that can't be happening. That's so terrible. But then, if reporters are doggedly determined enough, usually it becomes, you know, the evidence is incontrovertible and it becomes like, Oh, I, I mean, I, a couple, just a, a case in point, a couple of years ago, I remember just going back home and talking about a lot of this kind of thing. And I, people looked at me as though I had 
five heads. And mm. now I've had the experience where people, I see what you mean. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I totally do. And indeed you can't, you can't let your heart become so calloused. Reporters and journalists do become jaded. And I understand that too, because we see all kinds of things that most people never do. And then especially when you see how some things are reported and you know, other details that maybe you can't corroborate, but you know, are true. It's just so mm. frustrating because you know, there's more to the story than that. And, mm. um, you know, I've made mistakes and we've all, you know, we do, we do our very best, but I think um, there's just, there is something very special about as hard as it is to be on, you know, to be at the front of something and exposing the truth such that then the public can say, well, at least we knew about it because people will not be able to say, I mean, for I mean, I, I very I get very hot under the collar about the corporate press who I know knows the truth and are deliberately deceiving and lying about it. But I've I've reported on a couple of play, you know, I'm you have no excuse. Mm -hmm. You knew about it and you choose you chose to partner with an ideology that twisted and warped our very means of communication and service to a dogma built on lies, and you chose to look the other way. Like I wouldn't want to be in their shoes when all of this comes crashing down. But I think for, for those who are either, again, just a little too scared to engage this issue, I want you to ask yourself this. And when you think about your own heart in this, as you continue to think about these things, how many is too many? How many children, teenagers and young adults have to wind up sterile with destroyed sexual function, brittle bones, because that's what the blockers do, and, and brittle bones, and fractured psyches, and a surgically disfigured body in service to a lie called gender identity before you will rise up in moss together as a people and say, not on my watch, not one more. Yeah. Elizabeth, I think one child being disfigured and sterilized is one too many. Yeah. And when I look at, I don't, I'm a single guy. I don't have kids yet, but I see my two little nephews. I do anything for them. And I think that you you need to look at your kids and think about what you would do to protect them and whether and just count the cost and start to speak up. Yeah. And if you're not that type, if you're not wired to be a prophet in the streets or whatever, find a way where you can help the coming wave of detransitioners who are going to need a lot of follow up recovery care yeah. from the medical torture that was unleashed on them. The stories I'm hearing. I mean, I just met a poor guy last week who he's got body tremors and I think he's losing his eyesight because of the hormones of what they've, what they've done to his body. It's absolutely horrific. Mm. This spell, by the grace of Almighty God, when it breaks off of our society, I know I will be among the few that's not shocked by the vast scope of how many have been harmed. Some people are going to be shocked. I won't be. Um, this has devoured a lot more people than I think people could possibly have imagined. Um, but that's why we always have to keep telling the truth. Are you aware of any, um, as we close, are you aware of any um, resources for people who are wanting to detransition or even just interviews? Is there a documentary where it's uh, people that regret the decisions that they made? Mm -hmm. Is there anything out there like that? There is. I'm happy to tell your viewers about uh, a documentary that my friend, Jennifer Law made. She's and Kelly Fell, their Center for Bioethics and Culture. Um, she made a film that was released just last September. It's available on Vimeo. And indie filmmakers, man, they're saving the day. And the journalists are lying, all this good to corporate press, but the filmmakers, like the muckrakers of old, they're really saving the day. Her film profiles three women. Uh, it's called The Detransition Diaries Saving Our Sisters. Jennifer's a wonderful Christian, but this film is not, it's not preachy, so it's accessible to you know everybody. The Detransition Diaries, Saving Our Sisters. It's on Vimeo, with Center for Bioethics and Culture. I think it's like five bucks to watch, but it's it's great. It profiles these three women who, all of whom took testosterone, one of whom got her breasts cut off. And it sort of gives you the window into their inner thought lives of what led mm -hmm. them down this path. And it's punctuated by a terrific panel that Jennifer did in uh, New York City with some journalists and advocates and uh, some some folks who sort of give shape to this issue and why it's so important that we fight um, against this, especially because girls, young girls, teenage girls are predominant demographic now being sucked into this contagion. There are boys affected as well, but this is really coming against um, young women. I see it. 
you talk about spiritual warfare. I think this is an attack on Eve. This is just this a ferociously misogynistic movement. Transgender uh, dogma is. I know it's why a lot of radical feminists I know are, are fighting it too. Um, but that movie is excellent. Um, the Detransition Diaries: Saving Our Sisters. Uh, and there's also another one called Affirmation Generation. Um, I think that's on Vimeo as well. It sort of unpacks a lot of it. It's all made by left wingers. So there's a few little things in there that I would differ with, but. There are resources increasingly out there. Um, I would also urge everyone to familiarize themselves with the testimony of Chloe Cole. She's been in the news a lot lately, and I think she's becoming the face of those uh, who were trans as minors. Mm. She was put on blockers and hormones, I believe, at age 12 or 13, and then had her breasts cut off at 15. And mm. so unlike previous detransitioners who underwent this as adults, People start to really pay attention when you realize, okay, we disfigured a child's body. What I mean, that's her. So her case is quite. She's suing the 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 hospital center that performed this on her, and so that's. Wow, good. And I'd be expecting a lot more of those kinds of cases as more and more take similar legal action. Good for them. I think that's going to have to happen. Yeah. Wow. Well, you've given us a lot of great resources. And again, we just recommend your book, um, The Exposing the Gender Lie, How to Protect Children and Teens from the Transgender Industry's False Ideology. You want to show that book again? It's an sure. ebook, so you can have it's it. Ebook, yeah. yeah. You can go to summitministries.org and it's on their homepage. You also get it at Christian Post, christianpost.com slash ebook slash gender hyphen lie. And it's there. Um, but we'll we, get all those links. I think we're going to be making a lot more noise about this book and possibly having some more print copies. So stay tuned for that. But, you know. Yes, absolutely. Well, thank you again for your time, Brandon. And we just appreciate, you know, the, the, the integrity with which you're um, doing what you're created and called to do. And I, I just am excited to say I interviewed you when. <laughs> <laughs> As I know, it will get harder and harder in the future to get you on uh, smaller <laughs> programs like this. But that's an honor. Uh, and we just, you know, I just want to pray over you, even. I appreciate it. Thank Lord, you. Lord, I just agree with everyone that is uh, watching, listening right now over Brandon and over Dr. Jeff Myers and the stand that they've taken to equip us to understand um, how we can show up um, in, in, love and truth against the lies that are being perpetuated ultimately about you and how you created us and, and the children that we love so deeply in our generation and the generations to come. And God, I ask that you would just continue to protect them. And um, for Brandon specifically, Lord, I ask that you would just give him his sweet spot. And for now, it's, it's related to this. And as you um, shift him into other arenas. I ask God that he would just have wisdom, uh, which doors to, to go through and, and begin digging and researching and, and speaking as a, as a voice of truth and light and life to our generation. And we thank you for his ministry. We thank you for his, um, his, his impact, his voice. And we just bless you in Jesus name, Brandon. Amen. Well, thanks so much for joining us for your time. Is there anything else you'd like to say in closing? Well, I'll I'll I'll, I'll end on an encouraging note. Awesome. Um, for your audience, I was I was interested. I was very depressed about this whole thing, as you might imagine. There are a few of those moments where I get very upset mm -hmm. about it. But I was um I did graduate school last year, as you mentioned at the beginning, at Catholic University of America, where I did my graduate studies and. Over Thanksgiving break, I was praying with some friends. This would have been fall of 2021. And I was interceding about this. And I just kind of having one of those how long, oh, Lord, moments with some friends who were interceding and mm. specifically about the chemical and surgical abuse of children. And how can God let this go on? It's just so terrible. I'm so tired. I don't know what to do. I'm in graduate school. and I'm still getting messages from parents. And, I'm, you know, it's just all this horrible mm -hmm. stuff. And. We, we prayed together and I just had this sense that the Holy Spirit say to me, the wicked will soon be dethroned. Mm. Just that one phrase, Come on. specifically in the context of those who are abusing children like this. And it's just the timing is the hardest part, but I just don't believe it's going to be that much longer. I don't know when, but there's a reckoning coming. And I believe that those, you know, Jesus has some very harsh words about those who lead children astray. And for those who are, pushing this medical abuse on them. 
I'd be shaking in my boots if I were you. But um, I do believe that the wicked will soon be dethroned. That has spurred me on. I heard of a pastor who had a dream some years back where the Lord said something similar to him. That was in fall of 2019, where a very similar message was conveyed. And I was when I, when I heard him describe this dream that he'd had, I had I was driving and I'd heard, I pulled over the car on the side of the road and I just wept because of how much it encouraged my heart. And so. Mm. You, it's, you have to have a relationship with the Lord and the Holy Spirit to do this kind of thing. It's, I mean, you have to anyway, but when you're really engaging this darkness, you have to be able to lean in. And in the ways in which I've sensed God speak to me, that really spurs me on. And I hope that that's encouraging for everyone's watching that the Lord sees and knows yeah. that he will avenge this wickedness. And I do believe that a cleansing is afoot um, and that this child abuse will come to a swift end and that there will be a reckoning. So... I believe that. Yeah. Yep. And the redemption for every life that has been um, affected by this is is available, like Mm -hmm. not just for eternity, but here. And I believe. Let's believe God for some supernatural miracles to restore bodies. You know, why not? I I believe in that. I'm of that tribe. Let's let's believe for great things, even though it seems impossible. Nothing is with God. So. Well, and so many that um, have, you know wrestle with it yeah truly have wrestled with it i think sometimes you know the somebody jumps on the issue when a child just barely shows any kind of confusion right maybe it wouldn't even be lasting confusion but those that have really like it's become torment for them and they're looking right. for some kind of change they're leaders they were born yeah. leaders and the enemy has come hard after them and and he doesn't get the last word on That's their right. bodies or on the, the the leadership that God has <clears throat> called them into in time, and and they will be, uh, they will be incredible leaders in 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 the future of our of our nation. So and families being restored, this families, families, yeah. families, families, families being restored. I I believe that you know what the enemy meant for evil, God can turn around for good. That's not a cliche. He really right. does. And so concurrent with like helping the transitioners and be healed medically and you know their bodies being repaired yeah let's see it let's see a revival of family restoration as well let's do it all right well thank you so much brandon and we just um look forward to another time when we can have you on and appreciate your time today thank you elizabeth